Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me. I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. I'm the social media manager for The Walking Dead. How are you guys? This week, we have a massive, massive guest. In fact, probably the biggest guest we've had on the show so far. That's right. I got to interview Robert Patrick from Terminator 2, Scorpion, X-Files, Perry Mason, you name it, he's probably been in it. Now, I was extremely nervous to interview him. This happened about a month ago, and I hope none of that actually comes through in the interview. If it does, I'm sorry, but he's a massive actor, and it was just such a pleasure to have him on. If you're wondering, Johnny, why are you having Robert Patrick on? Well, it's because he played this character named Maze in the most recent episode of The Walking Dead. He was fantastic in it, and I can't wait for you to hear the insight he has to provide from that episode and also about his career and how he went from literally nothing to becoming one of Hollywood's finest. I'm so excited for you guys to hear it. So without further ado, let's get into it right now. This is Robert Patrick. So uh, you moved around a lot as a kid. Why was that? Mm -hmm. My old man quit jobs. Oh, okay. Uh, In 1968, he went from... uh, Lockheed Aircraft, he got a scholarship to MIT mm-hmm. and went there and got his uh, master's degree. He was a Sloan, uh, part of the Sloan uh, Fellowship. Uh, he was a part of that program, got his master's, and then he came home back to Georgia and went back to work for Lockheed. And then he switched careers and he went into banking. Mm. Uh, and that's what moved us to Dayton, Ohio, and then later to Detroit, and then later to Cleveland. So by the got time it. they got to Cleveland, I had already graduated high school. I went off for a year of college at Bowling Green State University. And you played football, great. right? Well, I, 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 I lasted about a week or so with the football team, quit. Oh, no. Uh, very disenfranchised. Really had no business being in college. Had no idea why I was there. And uh, uh, subsequently ended up doing about a year there and, and leaving Bowling Green. So, Did you always want to become an actor? No, no. Okay. I wanted to play football. I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to do stuff like that. And uh, so by the time I graduated high school and all that, uh, and once I realized, you know, there was no future for me in football because I was a good player. I just wasn't mm-hmm. fast enough, wasn't big enough, you know, that kind of thing. What position? Uh, and I really didn't have the heart for it. I was a linebacker and a fullback. Mm. And once I realized, you know, like, you know, I'm going to be on the scout team forever and I'm going to get my knees are going to be ruined and I'll be 28 years old by the time I graduate college. <laughs> And then I really started to ask myself, why am I here? I'm not here. I'm not, I'm not here for anything. There's nothing I want to do. I don't want to do anything. Uh, I think I was studying accounting and uh, it was there that it kind of all, my life fell apart. And then uh, I sifted through the asses, ashes, so to speak. And, uh, you know, figured out I wanted to be an actor. You had a boating accident on Lake Erie, right? Yeah, that's true. And isn't that kind of like a... From what I've read, it seemed like sort of a transformative experience for you. That was the kick in the ass. That was the <laughs> kick in the ass where God said, you got all this stuff you want to do. You're thinking about doing, but you're not doing. What kind of motivation do you need? And I was praying for some sort of motivation because I, mm-hmm. I wasn't really doing much. I wasn't I wasn't living up to my, my own personal expectations. So it was very philosophical and, you know, introspective. Wow, what do I do? Where do I go? What do I, what do I want to do? And I had kind of formulated that I, I really wanted to do something special with my life. And what was, what was special to me, what would give my life a sense of purpose in my eyes? And I said, you know, I've always loved acting. I'd done it a little bit when I was in, in school. And I always wondered how those guys, those kids that I saw in movies and stuff like, I wonder how they got to do it. I really, I think that's really what I want. And uh, it was during that time I was living in Cleveland and I was waiting tables and bartending and all sorts of shit that I was doing, painting houses. And that boating accident happened and it was a kick in the ass from God to get yourself motivated and get going. And so as I was swimming in to the boat, uh, to the Euclid Yacht Club, and uh, I went and I got some guys to go back and save the other guys' lives, I had already determined a date and time that I was going to leave Cleveland and, and, and go pursue my dream. I was afraid. I was afraid to. And you know, when you're afraid of something and then you're praying for some sort of motivation or some sort of strength and uh, something to kind of spur you along and lead you down the way, 
and God does something like take a boat and literally turn it upside down and sink it, uh, you listen. Yeah. And um, about a month and a half later, uh, I think that was in July that happened. And in September, I, I, September 15th, I left Cleveland for Los Angeles. Is this 84? 1984. So you make it to LA with not much. No, I didn't right? have much at all. I didn't have much at all. I had a car, I had a sleeping bag, I had an American flag, I had a phone. I had this huge American flag that I'd gotten from a Cleveland Union Hall. Uh, a phone, I had an answering machine, a phone. See, in those days, kids, you had to take that shit with you. Yeah. <laughs> because it wasn't one of these and you didn't right. have GPS and you, you had all, anyway. So I, I got to LA and uh, I, drove around all the, the landmarks that I'd seen. I'd never been west of the Mississippi and I didn't have any place to go and uh, slept in my car a lot and took care of my hygiene and gas station bathrooms. And, and eventually uh, a lady uh, rented me a, a furnished apartment in Koreatown and uh, asked me uh, if I had first and last and I did. And, uh, and uh, she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an actor. And she said, uh, uh, well, I can get you a job at a restaurant up the street, this uh, La Strega <laughs> restaurant. And I ended up getting a job waiting tables. And the, the uh, producer of the first play I was in in L.A. was was there as a waiter. And he was producing a play about the, the really? beat generation. And, and uh, he said, you know, you uh, I think it'd be great. I, I'd love for you to audition. I auditioned. I got the part. And uh, the rest is history, as they yeah. say. <laughs> So you, you do a, a few roles and then you're in Die Hard 2. Some people uh -huh. may not remember. You're in Die Hard 2. You get killed by Bruce Willis. Um, mm -hmm. And I heard you actually ended up uh, just kind of lying on the ground as they're taking photographs. Yeah, well, my, 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 uh, my attitude was that I may not know what the fuck I'm doing. And I don't have, you know, a degree in acting from some prestigious university. But I'm going to outwork them and I can do stunts and I'm a physical guy and I'm going to, I'm going to apply a good Midwestern work ethic, blue collar work ethic to this pursuit. And that was an example of that. I, I, I got shot by Bruce. I died. I knew enough from the Roger Corman movies. You know, you want to kind of set your, you, the, what, however you ended up is kind of the way you want to be until they take right. pictures and all that kind of stuff and make sure you can reset. And, um, they never released me, so I just laid there. And I, Bruce kind of took notice and said, you know, we better hurry up and do something because this guy's got rigor mortis here. He's not moving. <laughs> I think I, I actually I, killed he, him. I think he had an appreciation for where I was coming from because I, I just wanted to do a good job. I wanted to give it that work ethic. So you're kind of like an undrafted rookie making the practice <laughs> squad and then... I was like a walk-on. Walk-on, yeah, there like you go. A, yeah, like a walk-on to uh, the motion picture industry. Not invited, but I came anyway. Right. And then uh, Die Hard even though it was a small role, that still must have been pretty validating at the time, right? Well, it was. And to me, it was a very emotional and uh, a big experience because uh, uh, the play I did, I, uh, uh, I got a bunch of Roger Corman movies. And at a certain point after all these Roger Corman movies, I asked uh, Roger to get my SAG card and, and I got my SAG card. And, and Die Hard was the first audition I had as a newly minted, printed member of the Screen Actors Guild. And the first time I'd ever been on a, a movie lot. And here I was on the 20th Century Fox lot going to meet Rennie Harlan. And he cast me on the spot wow. in the room with Jackie Birch, the casting director. And I was floored. And I was so floored. He said something about, you might have to cut your hair because they had this beautiful bouffant, you know, pompadour thing going. And, he said, you might have to cut your hair. And I said, I'll shave my fucking head. <laughs> and, whatever uh, it takes. you know, whatever it takes. And then I, I remember going to my car and literally, you know, just sobbing with uh, joy that 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 had happened to me, uh, validated the moving out and uh, the, the, the work I had done with Roger and, and um, this magical thing of being in Die Hard 2 happened. And it was more money than I'd ever made in my life. And I took that money and uh, bought my wife an engagement ring and uh, uh, asked her to marry me. And uh, 
Yeah. So Die Hard was a magical, uh, magical thing. And it was the first of my sequels. Mm, right. Yeah. No, I kind of have a history. Actually, I did Hollywood Boulevard Part Two. Mm. I did Hollywood Boulevard Part Two as my SAG card. Then I did, it was the second of my sequels. Then I did Die Hard 2, which eventually led to T2. T2. So that role was actually, which is so iconic, obviously. I know you've talked to, to death, but some people might not know that uh, Billy Idol was originally slated to have that role, right? Yeah, that's true. They, 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 they had Billy Idol when I went to Stan Winston. Once I got cast, I went to Stan Winston. First thing Stan Winston said to me at his studio was, Robert motherfucking Patrick. I think he was just looking at me like, who the fuck are you? Because it was. It was like, who is this guy? And um, uh, Billy had gotten hurt on a Harley Davidson on a motorcycle. Mm. He had had a motorcycle injury to his leg, which was going to prohibit him from being able to uh, uh, perform the physical aspects of the stunt. Little did I know that I, you know, Jim had been pushing the other way. He didn't, Mario Cassar uh, in, in, Corelco were kind of going for Billy as the name. They thought it'd be great. And Jim was looking for an opportunity to get an unknown. So the story goes. Right. <laughs> uh, and somehow that vacuum was created miraculously for me to get a chance to get in there in front of Mally Finn and do a, a do an audition where I didn't realize I was going to audition. It was, uh, it was just a meeting with Mally and, and uh, my, my uh, agent at the time, I think he described me as a, a, a cross between David Bowie and James Dean or something. He said, he's got that mm, kind I can of see look that. and that kind of presence. And that tweaked their interest a little bit. Cause Billy has sort of that kind of thing going. And uh Billy would have been too famous for the role, in my opinion. Like I love well, that you it wouldn't was have been, an unknown. You, yeah, you, know? you wouldn't have. That's that's just, that's exactly right. They they you would, Donna, you wouldn't have been able to. Um, <laughs> excuse me, you wouldn't able to have seen him as the T one thousand. It would have been Billy Idol first, then the T one thousand. With right. me, what Cameron was looking for was somebody mm. without a preconceived uh, uh, identity. No one knew who the fuck I was. Right. Yeah. So you would accept me as the T-1000 because you never see me in anything because all I've done was all these obscure Roger Corman movies and and uh, you'd never see me. So, you know, it, it, it fit perfectly. It's funny now. Uh, I enjoy talking about T2 because and I've, I've, it, it hasn't always been the case. But as time goes by, you realize, my God, it is a huge movie. Yeah. People to this day are still talking about it, still entertained by it. Uh, it holds up. You can oh, yeah. watch it. It's a fantastic film. Yeah. And you go, oh, that? And that is me. I am in that. I, you know, I went through that. And I think back in the challenges of the day when we were filming it and the things that we were trying to pull off and those things, excuse me, are the things that make it so special. The practical stunts, the CGI, Stan Winston and the animatronic creatures he created for my guy in particular, and the stunt work. You know, it's just, <clears throat> it's all practical. Uh, it's a fantastic film. Right. And new generations keep discovering it, which must be fun. But I know that's the role that really springboarded your career. I mean, could you even go to a grocery store after that? Like, it was such an iconic face, such an iconic role. That must have been tough to suddenly have all this celebrity. It was, and I was not prepared for it. Uh, mm. I was very insecure, and I, I was not very confident in my abilities, nor as myself as a human being. So I was very insecure. Uh, I couldn't deal with it very well. I remember when it started happening, and it was scary to me. And no one... You know, now I think back and go, I don't, I don't know what the hell I was afraid of, but uh, you know, I just wasn't a, as a well-formed uh, human being, um, and it caused me problems. Um, a lot of it was, it's not so much giving up your privacy or anything like that. It's a lot of it is that they, no one, re it, they didn't really, they didn't know it was, they knew it was me, they recognized my face, but they didn't know who I was. Right. And that was the problem, I think, more than anything. So 
I did something very stupid. I, 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 had, I had given up alcohol and drugs to do the T-1000. I got, mm-hmm. I got totally sober to do that film and I should have stayed sober, but unfortunately I didn't. And uh, I started drinking heavily and uh, I had a lot of problems dealing mm-hmm. with the fame, the pressure, what's next. Am I any good as an actor? I mean, this right. this was this was right in my wheelhouse. But are there other things that I can do? You know, and and I got to prove that to people. And you know, you just feel like everything's coming down on you. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it, I'm not the first actor that's gone through that route, uh, that battle. And and um, your insecurity or your lack of uh, self confidence, you know, you you figure out a way to self-medicate. Sure. And uh, so I had about three or four years of, of trying to figure out what was the next thing for me to do. Uh, and f- it, it finally dawned on me that I can't keep walking into director's offices because everybody, the directors would see me and they would go like, well, yeah, you're great at uh, the stunts and the physical part, but you don't say much in the film. And like, you know, how does he do dialogue? And some directors go, you know, you were a bit stiff and wooden in that movie, whatever the fuck, you know, mm. it's like, well, I was, I was, wow. a, I was a robot. I was literally a robot. Uh, <laughs> I was an, a, a liquid metal robot. I'm not sure if you guys got the point of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, so, and you, and a lot of that was, you know, maybe I just thought that was what they thought of me. You know, uh, I was way in my head mm. and uh, I finally just realized I, I, I've got to, I've got to change my appearance. So I let myself kind of go. I gained weight and grew my hair long and grew a beard and really tried to hide. And I did successfully to where I got a, a, a role in a film called Fire in the Sky. Right. Which was uh, Rob Lieberman, the director, didn't even realize I was the same guy from T2. But he was really? impressed with my audition for that movie and he gave me the part and then found out. Oh, that's the guy from T1. That's the fucking T1000 guy. So that was a uh, 93, you know, right? About yeah. So mm-hmm. and 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 that happened, and then that kind of that kind of opened some doors for me. And um, uh, I think uh, when did I finally quit drinking? I think it was uh, Copland was the first film I did that I was sober. Okay. From T2. Is- so uh, and it, it come to find out, it's probably one of my best performances. So. <laughs> There's, I've been sober for 25 years now, and I think that's the smartest thing. I'm, I, I, I know you didn't ask me the question. No, I just feel, this is interesting. I feel like it's important for me to share that with people because it might have an effect on somebody that's going through something similar, and uh, you know, uh, uh, this could this could be of of service to them. Was it a gradual quit from alcohol, or was it like a cold turkey one well, day? Well, I was smoking a lot of, of weed too. And, okay, <laughs> uh, my wife really wasn't crazy about having babies with me. Uh, smoking weed and, and, and drinking as much as I was. And once I quit smoking dope, it was, I started drinking heavier, trying to figure out chasing the buzz. And then, sure. uh, uh, I, uh, I, fi- I finally had to deal with that. I I've, I've got to quit. And, uh, and I did, I white knuckled it, which was hard. I didn't, I, I, it took me about four or five years of white knuckling it to realize I needed to go to meetings and go and be with other people that were having the same sort of problems. Uh, so I, I think it, I quit and then it took me another four or five years to accept the fact that, you know, I was an alcoholic, you know, sure. I, I couldn't admit that. And, uh, so anyway, it's part of my recovery. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're telling me. Thank you. It's, you know, important also for, as you said, the people listening, you know, some people it's might be going through it, especially yeah. right now in the pandemic. I mean, there's it's, gotta yeah. be a lot of, yeah. this is not helping a lot of people. No, it's not. And I'm very proud that I've been able to maintain mine during all this. And my, my, my thing is, is look, I, I realize that there are a lot of people that can do a lot of things. They can do recreational drugs. They can, they can have occasional glass of wine and all that kind of stuff. And they're normal with that stuff. And that's cool. But if you have a problem and it becomes an addiction or it becomes an obsession and something you have to do on a daily basis and, you know, something that you chase, uh, it's not a good thing. And during these kind of uh, times when, uh, you know, we're, we're forced to uh, quarantine and, and deal with ourselves. That's the best time to kind of give that up. You got to deal with yourself head on. You got to ask yeah. yourself the tough questions. So, right. A lot of uh, 
internal kind of like looking at the mirror and being like, who am I kind of thing? Yeah, no, yeah. it runs in my family. So I try to, even if it's just a glass of wine, I try to, you know, hamper it down. Well, my wife's normal, you know, yeah. my, wife, oh, yeah. my wife's normal and, uh, and God bless her. So you got cast around this time, uh, you got X-Files, which was big. And there's the Sopranos, which didn't the well, Sopranos, Sopranos actually- was before, Sopranos was before the X-Files. This was before the X-Files, okay, yeah. yeah. I forget yeah. that the Sopranos started in the 90s. Uh, X-Files was 2000 or so. So yeah. you're getting more consistent roles. So that's gotta right. feel good. Are you, you know, you're in a better place in your life? Everything's going well? Well, yeah, the Sopranos was a, a, a great thing. And we, we'd already started to have some kids and. Uh, uh, my daughter and my my son was going to be born when we started the X Files. Sopranos, I did. David Chase and I had met for a movie. Uh, he asked me to come do this role. Uh, I had been working with uh, my acting coach, and 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 my craft had really, I think, uh, evolved into what it is today. Uh, a lot of hard work uh, on the craft itself. In the Sopranos was the the game changer for me, it came at that pivotal, pivotal point where I need to kind of transition. And uh, it made people look at me in a different way. Everybody in Hollywood watched The Sopranos. Right. Oh, yeah. So huge. everybody in Hollywood was watching The Sopranos. And they see me do something like that that's so vulnerable and so pathetic, uh, a gambling addict. And, right. uh, uh, you know, getting bitch slapped around by Jimmy Gandolfini. That opened up a lot of doors. And uh, right. uh, Chris Carter... Uh, it, it, and it opened up doors to me. It made me think of television and say, I, I'd like to do TV. Uh, I think the great writing on television, uh, I'd like to do it. And I told my agents. And one of the first things that popped up was, uh, was uh, the X-Files. And Chris Carter had seen Fire in the Sky, and I'd made an impact on him. And he thought of me for this uh, John Doggett role. And uh, uh, that was a great experience. One of the greatest characters I've ever played. And uh, one one that I really enjoyed, and I was working with some of the finest people in the entertainment industry, uh, television industry, uh, Chris Carter, Frank Spotnitz, uh, Vince Gilligan, John Scheiben. They've all gone yeah. on to do great things. And uh, Jillian Anderson, of course, and, and uh, uh, Mitch Pileggi and uh, Annabeth Gish and uh, James Perkins. And, uh, you know, it was just it was just wonderful. It was like making a movie. You got two seasons on that, right? Work. Huh? Two seasons out of that, right? You, yeah, I did yeah. two seasons, which I think is 44 episodes. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it was real hard work, uh, but I loved it. It was like punching a clock. It was like going to work in a factory, which I've worked in. And uh, I felt so great being on my feet and working every day. And I really wanted the show to work. Uh, I, was huge, I was devastated. I'm going to say I was devastated when they pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had been told that if, if the show worked, they were going to keep going with it. And, uh, and I thought the show was working. So uh, I, was, I was very disappointed because at that time I was a get. You know, you're, you're basically a film actor that's going to TV where that was kind of what they would call a get. And you're only a get once. Once they got you, they got you. Right. So that moment was gone when they canceled it. And, uh, and I've I've been fortunate, knock on wood, that I've been able to go from film back into television, back and forth. Uh, the advantage of being a character actor, you can do that a lot easier than, uh, you know, someone that's just branded a leading man. And, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, the first impression of me is as, as a villain. So I'm branded as a villain. And then, you know, Chris gives me a wonderful opportunity to be a, a, a leading man and uh, uh, somebody of nobility and then you're able to do that. But I be, I, I'm able to kind of play all of that now. And, and as a character actor, I'm given a hell of a lot more opportunities uh, than a lot of other actors. How do you personally measure success? Is it the consistency of roles? Is it like the, how big a role is? Anybody that can make a living as an actor is a, su as, is a success. Yeah. That's how I measure it. There you go. Yeah. No, you, and I looked at your IMDb, it's stacked. I mean, you've done everything, it seems. Well, there's some are, that are on there that aren't, that aren't, I've got some coming out that aren't on there. So I'm kind of wondering mm. who is the person in charge of updating my IMDb because uh, <laughs> it's not all, it's not fully there. But anyway, what the hell? I don't know who's in charge. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've, we, I've got some great things coming out. 
Uh, okay. Maybe they're not on there because I'm not supposed to talk about them. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've got some surprises on there besides, besides uh, the things I think that are listed. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm super excited as I get older, you know, uh, I'm 62 years old. I can't wait to see the parts that are going to be given me. It's, I'm, I'm really excited about what happened with the walking dead. Uh, yeah. such a, such an iconic show and to be invited to be a part of it. Uh, yeah. How did that opportunity uh, come about? I think Gail and Heard, maybe, I don't know. I don't, maybe okay. the casting, maybe the casting, uh, 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 uh office the casting director uh i i i i think that uh, is probably how that all came about yeah i'm pretty sure i want to say the names of the casting director but now all of a sudden i have a little doubt did you know gail from the terminator days i think sharon bialy and sherry thomas cast okay the got walking it. dead do they got it I, I'm not sure. I don't know the names offhand. I wish I, I did. I think they but... do. So I'm going to go with that. They've okay. been big fans Sounds of good. me and, and have done some wonderful things for me over the years. And um, I'm pretty sure that's who it was. And Gail Ann Hurd, I'd worked with, uh, well, T2, uh, not really directly, but, uh, uh, and then I did Lore for her. Right. For Amazon Prime, I did an episode of Lore and I had a lot of fun. And I remember Gail during that time. So maybe that's how it came up. Your character, Maze, I know it was, you know, you kind of had your episode with Seth and Ross there. What was it like uh, filming on that set compared to others that you've been on? Uh, it was intimidating. You know, every time uh, you come in to a show that's established and going, and I don't do a lot of guest star television work. Sure. But it's, you know, that's one of the things about being a character actor uh, and being invited to come in and do these roles, whether it be a, a feature film, but, but, well, especially when you're going into a television show that's in production and, and they've got their rhythm and they've got their, their way that they work, you know, it's slightly intimidating. And right. um, you have to make sure that you're up for the occasion and you want to go in, you have your own personal reputation that you want to Make sure it stays intact. That you're professional. You're on time. You're uh, prepared, and you're you're uh, you, you're able to pull off what they're asking you to do. And and it's a good experience for them as well as it is for yourself. And you have to be cognizant of the fact that it's not your show, and they have a way to go about a way of going about doing things. And you've got to be amicable and fit yourself in there, and uh, you know make it work. And then that way, you know. You know, so all that's involved with it as well as is showing, you know, uh, just showing up and delivering your 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 rep reputation and making sure you leave it intact. So that's kind of going on, and you're you're not taking it lightly. This is a huge scene. Um, these guys are professional actors; they're fantastic. Uh, I think I reached out to Laura and said, uh, you know, what's your intention? How do you want to shoot this? Are you going to shoot this as one long take? Or are you going to break it down? And if so, where are the beats as I prepare? And it got back to me that she would like to see it go as one long take. And I went, wow, this is, you know, I think 18 pages of dialogue. It's 18 a lot. pages. Of this. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of beats. There's a lot of things you got to do. And I up for this. So, you know, you got to be damn sure you're ready. And uh, we went in and we rehearsed it the night before we were going to shoot it and got, you know, thankfully, all three of us were off book, mm -hmm. meaning we were on our feet and, and ready to play. And right. uh, it went well. And went at that at this level, that's what you want. You're, you know, you're doing scenes. It's a beginning, middle and end. Every scene is a beginning, middle and end. And you want to be able to, to uh, prepare yourself, show up and then react to the actors you're working with. And they right. kind of take you and help you tell the story. Right. Um, so that's how it, we approached it. It was intense. I mean, literally yeah. a life or death situation, but yeah. you, I, I, it was a joy to see you in the Walking Dead universe. It was so, cause I'm such a fan. It was just crazy to see you also playing around with that, like it with these characters. So oh, that's that must great have been, to yeah, that mu it's going to come out great. I can't wait for you to see it. If you haven't already, I've seen it. I'm, You've I'm seen happy it. With, okay, good. Yeah. I'm happy with it. They left everything in there and, and, uh, and they shot on digital, plays. right? Yeah, it's because uh, that's a big change. They've always done film since the Darabont. I think it's days. Alexa. I think it was Alexa. I might be wrong. It might be Red. I don't know. 
but that must have been a really cool experience, you know, uh, being involved with such a big well, show. Yeah, it was. It's a great show, and 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 the enormity of it is you realize how important this role is and how it fits. And, you know, I'm, I'm really there supporting those guys in their story. Right. You know, Gabriel is heading down a very, very dark path this yes. season, next season. And he's, you know, what I was shocked. Guy, yeah. I mean, what he did to me was <laughs> unbelievable, you know, cause you think about my character. I mean, obviously I'm a religious man, and and I'm a religious man in real life. And to sit there and say, you know, like, you know, I read the Bible and it's all, you know, that's why I, that's why I wipe my ass with it. And right. it's, you know, pretty sacrilegious, uh, well, maybe sacrilegious is too severe, but it's it's uh, it's so disrespectful. And and uh, how did this guy get there was what I wanted to know how he got there. And then. What happened as we were doing the scene was the vulnerability of this guy began to be to come to the surface as we did the scene more and more. And I realized, wow, you know, Gabriel's character really connected with that or brought that out in me. And, and now his character is all the priests that I've dealt with and. I'm admitting to him, this man of God, that I've lost my way and I'm trying to find my way back. Right. And he brings me back into the flock. They both do. Right. And they play on that vulnerability. And I may be insane and maybe <laughs> losing my mind mentally, but I mean, I may or may not have been insane. I mean, I, I, the stress of that environment of the walking dead I mean, think about the stress. If you make that a literal concept to you of, oh yeah, there's With a survival and there's zombies and you got to fucking survive. Right. Boom. <laughs> Whatever you were before, you better hope you have enough training to figure out how to fucking deal in this world. So that stress and then the, the added thing of a uh, component of losing your faith that you've had and was obviously strong and the 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 um, betrayal of the brother was so biblical. Yeah, uh, it was. Yes, very Cain and Abel. So all these things, and then he willingly s becomes uh, s submissive to and wanting to go back and be a part of the flock. And they hook me. I and then Gabriel I, kills me. I mean, I know. What the I fuck is that? I felt so bad. I was like, no, I wanted to see more. And then we did that's see exactly more. That's what I was going for. As an actor, that's exactly what I'm going for. I want people at the, this is what I want. I want people at the end of this episode to be so disappointed, so outraged and horrified by Gabriel's actions that it's going to be bad for his character. It's, yes. it's a bad thing for his character. And I, and I, 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 I want to have the fans react that way. I hope I, I hope that will. they literally are sucked into the 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 drama of this story and uh, and I can win them over and then are devastated when he kills. Uh, when did you when did you shoot that episode? It was right before the election. Okay, so, so it was in October. Uh, the COVID protocols must have been pretty wild. It was a trip. Yeah, it was a trip. I've done two projects during COVID. One was a film I was doing with Samuel Jackson and Maggie Q in uh, uh, Romania, and then they moved to Bulgaria. And I, I was on my way back to Romania when the, they shut down the uh, March 12th, they shut down the country. So I couldn't go back and they had to postpone that part of the shoot until Bulgaria. And I think I went back there in June or July. And then I did another film here in Los Angeles with COVID protocol where I never saw the director. Wow. And the protocol was so severe. And then they had unbelievable protocol AMC had put in place at the studio down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, this COVID thing is a real deal. It is. And people, I wish more people wore masks and took it seriously because we're I just all dying to get anywhere. out of this. What? Yeah, I just don't, I just don't go anywhere. I mean, I, 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 I go to my set. And I come home to my house and I sit up here and I get everything delivered and 
I just don't go anywhere. Uh, I don't go I mean, down. I don't. I don't. I don't go to my dealership. I, I own a Harley Davidson dealership in Santa Clarita. I don't even go there. Wow, I, I just that's right. I'm avoiding people at all costs. Um, and you had to. Uh, they postponed the Love Ride last year, right? Well, we did the Love Ride. Oh, you did it. Okay. Uh, we did the. Well, we didn't do it. We didn't. We didn't do it last year. We did it the okay. year before. We can't. Wow. We canceled it last year. We might have to cancel it this year. I don't know. We'll Man. see. I, I I did ride across America twice on oh, my wow. Harley during COVID. That's cool. I mean, uh, the, the hotels were sealed up. Uh, I could get hotels. They were all cleaned and everything. And there wasn't a lot of restaurants open everywhere. So I had to, you know, gas stations. You couldn't. You know, it was it was an interesting trip. Yeah, it's like a real life apocalypse. Yeah, it was it was very strange. It was like a sci-fi movie. Wow. Yeah, very much so. And I, I just I, I you know you're wearing gloves and a motorcycle helmet anyway, so you, you don't have to take stuff off. And I was fine. I went all the way to Washington D.C. and came back. And then I went to Austin, Texas, and came back. I had no problem. Well, that sounds nice. I miss traveling. You know, you don't realize how much you miss things until they're gone. Well, I just came back from Canada. I'm up there uh, doing a, a project for HBO Max. Oh, cool. uh, with James Gunn and uh, John Cena. Oh, is this the Peacekeeper series? It is. I saw they've been doing some promos for that. Peacemaker. It was on Fallon or something. Yeah, the Peacemaker. Peacemaker, sorry. Uh, that's awesome. I can't wait to see you in that. That's, that's yeah, going to be huge. Yeah, I can't wait for you to see me either. Yeah, uh, it's, great to, it just, it's great to see you working so much. I'm glad that you keep getting amazing opportunities. You know, in my eyes, you're kind of, you know, not kind of, you're a, you are a legend. So I think it's wow, awesome. Wow, you're a great guy. You it's must true. You saw that movie when you were, you weren't even born when that movie came out. I, I was, I know, I, I'm going to age, I was born in 89. Um, oh, you, so were, you were alive, you were alive. I was you alive, I was around, but I saw it a little bit later. Yeah, but big fan. Uh, everyone have I you told seen, that have I'm, you seen T2 in, in, on, on the big screen? Hmm. I feel like I don't know. I feel like I have. I, I think they did like a rescreening of it somewhere. I, I definitely I, rem, I have a me memory of seeing it, but no. Yeah. If you ever get the opportunity to see it on a big screen, either an old print or the new digitally remastered 3D print Ooh. Ooh. that's around. Uh, and I'm sure somebody will screen it again here. Uh, yeah. You really got to see that movie on the big screen. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to make that happen once that comes back. Um, yeah. You, you told NPR, uh, before we wrap up, you told NPR that you never want to live a life for I wish I woulda. And it seems like you haven't done that. You've, you know, you've actually kind of done everything you've set your mind to so far. So are you feeling pretty satisfied? I'm feeling the clock ticking and I'm feeling myself being asked, is there, what else is there that you want to do? And do you want, you know, you, you better figure that out pretty quick if you want to do it. And oh, I, I don't want to say what that is, but uh, I am taking stock of my, uh, uh, where I'm at. And, 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 the, and if, if there is something else I want to do, I better do it. But I, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, who I was and what I was and, and what I set out to do. I'm very proud. Going from living in your car when you first moved out here with barely any money and just a flag and a voicemail machine all the way to where you are now, it's quite the American dream journey. It is. And I'm very fortunate. And I knock on wood and I share that with my, my children, and uh, uh, both of which are, are, are getting into showbiz and you know, and they have way more training than I do. And, and my son is a musical theater major at, at, at uh, uh, Boston Conservatory, Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a great testament to uh, just the audacity to believe that you can do something and you go out and try to do it and you, right. you make it happen. So I, 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 I'm, I'm aware of that. That's great. Well, it seems like you've done everything right so far, and it's such well, an incredible journey to, to chronicle. <laughs> Even if there were, I know body. it wasn't perfect, but you got there, you know, and yeah. uh, that shows how strong you are. So that's pretty cool. Here's pretty um, cool. Robert, I could talk to you about a million other things, but um, that's all I have I for you today. I probably took your time up. How no, you didn't. It? No, this is great. I, I had said this is such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, you, you know, uh, well, you scared the shit did. out of me at term and Terminator Two, and now I'm talking to you now, full circle for me too. So it's all working out. All right, big guy. God all bless right, man. You. It was great talking to you. Have a good one, man. All right, buddy. God bless. All right, see ya. All right, and that was my interview with Robert Patrick. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I had fun when I was talking to him. 
Was I nervous? Yes. Could you tell? Probably. It's okay. Anyway, next week, we will have another fabulous guest. I will announce that person sometime during the week on The Walking Dead Twitter, so make sure to follow us there and check that out. In the meantime, please be safe. Get a vaccination if you're eligible. And as always, for the love of God, happy birthday to Nate.